S in Hell, a look back at Saturday Night Live with your hosts, Matt and Keith. Brought to you by Lion's Den Audio Theater. Like and subscribe to Lion's Den Audio Theater for more Lion's Den goodness. And here are your hosts, Keith and Matt. Saturday Night Live, Season 4, Episode 6, starring Carrie Fisher. Originally aired on November 18th, 1978. Hello, welcome to SNL. My name is Keith. With me as always, my good buddy, Matt. <laughs> hey, Keith, what's up, man? Not much. And joining us tonight, one of our more prolific third chairs, tremendous fellow, it's Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Keith. Thanks for having me on the show again. Yeah, no worries. Carrie Fisher is tonight's host. We're all of the age of Star Wars. Carrie Fisher, the daughter of celebrities Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds, stepdaughter of Elizabeth Taylor. You might remember Elizabeth Taylor was on the show last week as played by John Belushi eating a big piece of chicken. Fisher appeared in the 1974 movie Shampoo before she became a white hot celebrity in 1977 for playing Princess Leia in Star Wars. That was over a year and a half before this episode of Saturday Night Live aired. But Fisher was still a white hot property. Her last work of note before this appearance was a TV movie uh, written for and starring Ringo Starr, and that aired in April of 78. And there was a TV movie as well with John Ritter. Uh, this episode of Star Wars aired one day after the Star Wars holiday special aired. Coincidentally, it was also the same night that uh, Jim Jones and the People's Temple uh, took their lives down in Guyana, November 18th, 1978. Kevin, Matt, let's talk about Carrie Fisher for a few here. Are you guys big fans of Carrie Fisher? I don't really know a lot of Carrie Fisher, to be honest, outside of the Star Wars stuff. She was in The Family Guy. She played Peter's boss. She had a funny uh, spot on 30 Rock. And uh, the, the career got a little shaky there for a little bit, didn't it? She she was quite open about struggles with mental illness and, and drug addiction and whatnot. And also, too, she went into she did a lot of writing as well, kind of got away from the acting side of things but she had a pretty good one woman show for a while too um i only caught bits and pieces of it i'd always wanted to see it live she's a pretty funny lady mm -hmm. i love her in uh the burbs with tom hanks do you remember that movie gentlemen <laughs> I, I do <laughs> yeah. a little bit oh the burbs is fun that's a fun movie well she had a nice range uh it just it's a shame she didn't really do a lot more stuff but at the same time um what she did do she excelled at didn't she play a nun in jay and silent bob as well uh, she, she sure did yeah. <laughs> and i did i love that 30 rock um appearance i think she she very much encapsulated the writer of a certain time you know oh yeah she went insane it was really funny yeah yeah this, it was liz's future was kind of what we were seeing there wasn't it <laughs> yeah. yeah ghost of christmas future yeah, yeah. <laughs> musical guests tonight are the blues brothers we last saw them um in well we see them every week but we last saw jake and Elwood in their bluesy form and Steve Martin season three episode 10 days after this appearance on November 28th, they were to release their album briefcase full of blues, which becomes a huge hit since the last appearance though, they've ramped up a lot with the band and, uh, and really been focusing on it a bit more than the comedy and had some opening acts over the summer. Like, uh, they had one for Steve Martin in Los Angeles. So the blues brothers, uh, Matt, you and I've talked about them a lot. Kevin, where do you sit on the Blues Brothers, or or do you? I'm neither here nor there. Like I like the movie. Um, I think that their music is quite well, but the the weird pseudo sequel they had years later kind of turned me off from it, to be honest. Just based on the movie alone, I I do love the Blues Brothers, and I I just like watching um, Dan Aykroyd and, and Belushi. I just like watching the two of them kind of work off each other because they they did fantastic. Yeah, I agree. I enjoy them great amount. Matt, you you weren't a fan. But then uh, are the last appearance you sort of softened a bit. Um, I'm interested to see as we go through where you're going to wind up after this one. Sure. I mean, I'm not looking forward to it. I feel like I know what I'm going to get. and It's just not for me. So let's jump right to the cold open. We have Garrett Morris at the microphone as some real boppy blues plays in the background. Garrett looks fantastic. He's dapper. He's got a smoke going. And I think he says his name is Joe Marquis. He's introducing the Blues Brothers, uh, really builds into a high energy entrance for Jake and Elwood. Jake, uh, which is Belushi, hits a cartwheel right away and uh, they go into Soul Man, where Dan is doing a really cool dance as well. Very high energy. They have a great backing band behind them. 
Uh, both Dan and John are totally into this. John more than he's been into any sketch this year. Great way to open the show. Garrett was great. Um, oddly enough, he comes out after the song finishes. Garrett comes out sort of half dressed to do the live from New York. Made me think he might have forgotten he was supposed to do that and started changing for his next sketch. All of the uh, sort of unpolishedness that was gone. They are a refined act now, and it is really good. I thought it was pretty high energy. Like it, it brought a lot. You tell that they're having a great time being the Blues Brothers. Like they're just enjoying every moment of being on stage and then playing music. And it just, uh, it kind of just hits you right from the get go that this is going to be hopefully an exciting show. I think it was a great opening. First of all, this better count as one of their uh, musical performances tonight. I count it, marking it off. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't love having music at the top of the show as the cold open, but you guys said it. There's no denying the the energy that they all brought it did its job effectively in getting me pumped for the show regardless of my feelings about the music yeah and your issue is you just don't like this kind of music right that's correct yeah and we get into the intro kevin is this your first season four episode it is kevin what do you think of the new intro uh since you've been with us last uh the pictures the very new york intro i was calling it it's it's okay the stat the static images are you know like it looks nice like obviously this is you know in the 70s but at the same time, I don't know I, I like the the openings where they kind of like pan around and you get more of a view of New York and you kind of get to see the the, the various performers kind of like in their element to a degree. Like I always yeah. enjoyed that myself, but it's not bad. It's better than the past few openings that we've had the, for the past <laughs> few seasons. But that's a I don't think that's a high bar to go above, to be honest. Well, you were with us for that season three opening where where their faces were floating in space or whatever it was that really weird one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like I said, not a high bar to go above. Like, obviously, they're going to get better in time, but, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's it's not great, but it's not yeah. bad. Yeah, I also noticed during the intro, we're going to see some Father Guido Sarducci tonight, which is always a welcome thing for me. We are now off to the monologue. Carrie Fisher enters in her Princess Leia costume. She says she was conflicted about whether or not to come out in costume, but worried people wouldn't recognize her if she just come out as herself. So she asked her good buddy, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who suggested the costume's fine, but she has to come out and give a good joke. So Carrie starts telling a joke about a Bantha getting stranded at Jabba's palace. And this is basically a variation of the old farmer willing to let the guy stay in the house as long as he doesn't touch his daughter. Carrie starts to think maybe the joke is a little too inside Star Wars, but then Obi-Wan's voice comes over and there's a strange flickering blue light. And Obi-Wan tells her to trust her instincts and tell the joke. She argues that the audience might be too sophisticated for such a joke. But Obi-Wan insists that she tells the joke. As she continues on and talks about Wookiees, Obi-Wan starts giggling. Obi-Wan says it's the best joke in the universe. Carrie suggests that maybe some people are getting a little too fed up with Star Wars. Uh, She then begins to finish the joke, says she's happy that she appeared in the movie and is glad she didn't appear in uh, a a sci-fi movie in the 50s. We get a really weird, it's a flub, a really weird cut to a stand-in standing in front of a green screen, which uh, really kills the lead here. So uh, Carrie kind of finishes the joke and then she just throws to the next sketch. I thought Carrie was fantastic. She was obviously loving being there. Kudos for getting in the Star Wars clothes. Um, Again, Star Wars is huge. You've got to address it. And they do address it here. And in the next sketch, they get it out of the way. And now they can move on with the show. Dan Aykroyd's Obi-Wan was hilarious with him giggling as she's trying to tell the joke. That glitch really killed the audience because everybody (laughs) it was one of the weirdest things ever. Apart from the glitch and what was in Carrie's hands, I thought she was excellent in this monologue. You know, she's fine. She seems comfortable, but uh, I did not enjoy this at all. This was one of my least favorite monologues in a while, in fact. I thought the jokes were really aggravating. Uh, I didn't get, I guess, what was going on with Obi-Wan Kenobi or if he was supposed to be anything like him because he was most assuredly not. And the light thing was weird, like. I think the exorcist who had just come out, it looked something like kind of weirdly like that. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, I thought it was a huge mess and I didn't find it funny at all. And her hair was like way off. Uh, Those rolls on the side looked terrible. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Just a train wreck. 
it's very pandery to the Star Wars fans because obviously that's the, the the demographic they're trying to get to watch this episode as well. Mm-hmm. Like, let's get the Star Wars fans in and then back to business as usual. She seemed very comfortable what she was doing. Dan Aykroyd did a great job as, as Obi-Wan. But from a lore standpoint, Star Wars wise, my brain was screaming at me. But I shut that part off because it has nothing to do with this. But it went on a little bit too long. Like, I feel like they could have done some sort of like maybe a different joke that kind of worked with the audience because the audience didn't seem too enthused about it until Dan Aykroyd started laughing and kind of disarmed them a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the flub happened and then they were like, please go to the next sketch, like finish this <laughs> off, like put Carrie out of her misery. Cause she's just like, look, the look on her face is I clearly want to do something else. Please let me stop doing star Wars. Like <laughs> if you think we're sick of star Wars now, she was definitely sick of it then especially yeah. after doing the the holiday special and the less said about that the better yeah I, I, and she didn't recall doing that is what her her story was if um, you've watched that special you'll see why she doesn't remember it very yeah. well <laughs> she's like staring off into the middle distance being like i can't wait to have the ham sandwich i'm staring at if it does in fact exist <laughs> We now go to Beach Blanket Bimbo from Outer Space, and this is a parody of those 1950s beach movies with Frankie Avalon and Annette Bonicello. Uh, There was a Chiron screw-up right at the beginning of this as well, so there's something going on technically. But My first reaction after Chiron screw-up was, holy shit, what a set. Full beach set with sand and everything. It was quite impressive. Sitting on the beach, Tom Davis, Al Frank, and Lorraine and Jane are playing teenagers, and they're talking about how great things are for them to be young and popular and innocent post-adolescence and how they're so innocent that they haven't heard of drugs, haven't touched drugs, and they haven't even heard about acid. And it's going to be seven years until they do. Bill and Gilda, of course, play Frankie Avalon and Annette Punicello. Frankie asks Annette to let him go all the way, but Annette says no. Frankie says please and (laughs) grabs her chest. Carrie then warps in, and this is why there was a green screen issue in the beginning. Um, And she's playing Princess Leia, an exchange student from outer space. Lorraine introduces everyone and says they're a popular crowd. Jane says they're a bunch of rich wasp kids and Italian teenagers living off their parents until it's hip to reject them. Gilda introduces herself and Frankie and her breasts, then tells Carrie it's the 1950s and nice girls don't go all the way. Carrie takes off her Princess Leia robe and expo- exposes a gold two-piece bathing suit. Frank and Davis are so blown away, they pass out, and I think Frankie says, talk about heavenly bodies. Frankie is immediately interested in Princess Leia. Dan then enters as Vincent Price, carrying marinated lamb that he's about to deliver to a friend who's a popular recording artist. Bill then demonstrates a kiss poorly to Princess Leia. Uh, Annette then interferes as she sees them kissing and they immediately go into a song the song is about uh, it's, it's a princess leia singing it it's about trying to be liked by everyone by both having friends that are girls and dating boys and just being the new kid on earth the background music during the refrain is people singing obi-wan kenobi obi-wan kenobi belushi then enters as biker kid eric von zipper who has heard there's a new broad on the beach who has more curves than the Ventura Freeway. And then Vincent Price re-enters with Chubby Checker, played by Garrett, and asks if they like to have fun. The kids all say yes, they like to have fun, and Chubby is delighted because there's nothing he likes more than entertaining white kids on a beach. They immediately go into a version of the twist that also has Obi-Wan Kenobi as the refrain. I thought this was an excellent piece. The tech, of course, made it weirder at the beginning. It's a very, very fun sketch. Everyone was all in, and almost everybody on the show, like, who works on the show was there. Definitely an excellent parody of this kind of film, from the corny dialogue to the random music number to just a random celebrity showing up on the beach ready to sing for a bunch of rich white kids. Triple thumbs up for Alan Zweibel's random surfs up as he runs across the stage with a surfboard. Only issue with this sketch for me is the tech stuff, including the the fact that the audio wasn't so great. Um, It was hard to make out the lyrics to some of the music. But uh, I really enjoyed this uh, a lot, actually. No, it wasn't for me, Keith. I feel like I pretty much feel the opposite. I, I really disliked it a great deal, and I found it super excruciating. Dan's Vincent Price is terrible. 
And maybe it's because I'm not, you know, I have no nostalgia for any of this 50s business. And I'm not super familiar with it, other than, you know, the tropes and the stereotypes, which are well on display here. Uh, And, you know, the idea, I guess, of Princess Leia showing up in a 50s bikini in one of these old timey movies probably looks maybe good on paper. But uh, I I didn't think any chubby checker Vincent Price added nothing. This uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi rhythm vocals were driving me up the wall. I hated this from start to finish. I'm of two minds. I think it's a great premise for a sketch, kind of. I think having everybody there kind of bring her into the to the fold for the for the rest of the show was also quite. It was fun to see everybody kind of playing around and working off each other. But it just it's it was long. It was very long. I thought it was way too long than it needed to be. Vincent Price just showing up and Chubby Checkers just showing up. You know, that's that's part of the course for some of these you know 50s beach movies which i for some odd reason know some of yeah it was weird it was just weird the the weird creepy pervert vibes from um dan Aykroyd felt more like john waters than it did uh vincent price and just <laughs> i think they just wanted to try and find a way to insert princess leia into a sketch and just get it out of the way i think maybe the the technical aspect maybe got everybody a little bit shaky because mm-hmm. i don't know if it was an audio thing or maybe it was just they were concerned about what happened at the beginning of the sketch where the, the tech flubbed a little bit, but it just seemed very rocky from the get go. But there was some some laughs here and there, but it could have been yeah. done better. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. It spoke to me. I loved it. And Matt, you have gone on record before as saying you hate Dan Aykroyd's Vincent Price impression. It's just so bad. He, he plays him as too much of a mincing her and yeah. not uh and not this villainous character uh that he is it's just a, an unusually bad impression there. are either of you familiar with michael mckeon or bill haters vincent prices not mckeon's i'm familiar with both i really like well, bill haters just really good with impressions though so yeah. it's hard to put someone against like in an unfair fight in situations <laughs> like that yeah both are both are better than Ackroyd's, though Ackroyd's doesn't anger me <laughs> We are now off to what's quite possibly the complete opposite style of sketch. It's the Loud family. Jane, Bill, Carrie, and Gilda play a family of people who are just extremely loud. The phone rings and Jane answers it. It's a boy named Kevin who has a crush on Joan, played by Carrie, who is going to come over to visit. Bill says he's glad that the boy is going to come over. Uh, The girl suggests that the parents tend to scare their boyfriends away. Dan Aykroyd then enters as uh, Gene's date Red, and Gene is played by Gilda. He is uncomfortable immediately with all the yelling. Seems to be a very soft-spoken gentleman. Bill mentions that they once had a third daughter who died in a skiing accident because of an avalanche. Kevin, played by Belushi, enters. Now, he works at an airport as an airport ground crew, and he still has his work uniform on, the full body suit and the uh, earmuffs. Bill and Jane then say they're going to leave the children alone and pound their way upstairs, and we begin hearing them having sex very loudly. Dan then pulls out a joint and hands it around, and the girls start yelling about how great the pot is. Bill and Jane then come back downstairs and send the girls into the kitchen because they want to speak to them privately. Dan asks John why the family talks so loud, but John can't hear him because he has the earmuffs on. Family fights very loudly in the kitchen until the doorbell rings and it's Garrett entering as a police officer. He comes in and tells everyone to quiet down because he heard them yelling as he was driving by. This was a ridiculously simple idea pulled off excellently. When Bill and Jane went upstairs and started having sex, I I burst out laughing because I did not see it, didn't see it coming or going that way. Garrett coming in as the cop saying he was driving by and heard them from the uh, from the street also got some big laughs from me. After this last huge production heavy, a lot of thought went into its sketch to have something this simple is a great contrast. This got me as well. I really, really love this sketch, even though on paper, this would be the first thing I would vote against if I was in a writer's room. Really well done. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think I'd like it on paper either, uh, as I think about it. I mean, I don't like loud people. I struggle with loud people. People that, like, you know, will sit beside me at a bar and scream in my ear. Oh, I, mean, I can't, I can, I can't handle it. So anyway, but I, so too much to my surprise, uh, I also really enjoyed it. I thought Gilda's shouting was especially loud and funny. And the crowd really seemed to enjoy her 
yeah, a fun, ridiculous concept that everybody was so into that when Dan comes in and he speaks at his regular voice, uh, it was hilarious uh, when, when he just wasn't doing anything. And her dying in an avalanche, also really very fun. Yeah, the avalanche line killed me, I have to say. it's It was very good. So good. Uh, I love small, stupid, simple premise sketches. Initially, I did have an issue with the ending because it just kind of seemed like it It just was like, here's the line. and then nah, 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 nah. But after a kind of a rewatch of it, I changed my mind on that. Uh, I really enjoyed the sketch. I think it was solid beginning to end. Fantastic. It's amazing when these overly simple ones work, eh? The best comedy is stuff you can kind of turn your brain off quickly and just like enjoy the premise and not, you know, not get too bogged down into it. Our next sketch is Mercy Killers. And I think this was a Franken and Davis. Gilda and Belushi play two people who's uh, they're a married couple. Gilda's mother, which is Belushi's mother-in-law, is now in a coma. The doctor, played by Jane Curtin, tells them that the old woman is suffering from a bunch of fake but convincing-sounding medical, medical conditions, and uh, she's in a complete vegetative state, except she can feel excruciating pain. Belushi reasons that keeping someone in pain at the cost of $2,000 a day is unreasonable, and he asks if there's any way they can put her out of her misery. The doctor says the decision is up to Gilda. Belushi says, honey, let's face it, she's a veg. Gilda still can't do it. So we cut to Dan and Bill in a different room. They're breaking into a filing cabinet, and uh, they read this old lady's file, and Bill says it sounds like a job for us. We then get a title card for mercy killings, because it turns out Dan and Bill are two mercy killers masquerading as hospital orderlies. Dr. Jane catches them in their office and is suspicious because there's been a lot of strange deaths happening in the hospital. She asks if they heard anything about the mysterious death in post-op. They they didn't. Cut to Lorraine and Carrie as two nurses back in the hospital room and they're walking Garrett into a hospital bed. So it turns out Garrett is in the same hospital room as the old woman. The nurses sedate Garrett. Bill and Dan come in and seeing a mildly sedated Garrett Assume he's the one that has to be put away. Bill notes that the file says that uh, Garrett should be a 78-year-old female Caucasian, but Dan chalks it up to another issues with the hospital's terrible filing system. Dan and Bill then smother Garrett with a pillow. Uh, Dan says that the people they can help can never thank them, but maybe someday someone will write a song about them. Bill sings a song about the Mercy Killers over the closing credits. I thought this was a very funny sketch. It's definitely kind of pertinent these days with medical assisted death being a big news item. Uh, I found it strange that Jane had the lead female part uh, and not Carrie, but Jane certainly pulled it off. Dan and Bill's sneakiness in when they were caught in the office was, was just great. I thought this was pretty clever. I felt pretty middle of the road about it personally. I really liked uh, some of it. I thought Jane uh, and uh, Gilda and Belushi, that, that little part was great. And Belushi really made me laugh. And Jane is really good as like the back giving the bad news doctor. The, the the premise itself is fantastic. Like these two idiot custodians in a hospital thinking they're mercy killers and doing their best. Like seems like very fertile ground. But I just don't really like what they did with it. I thought it was just a little too unbelievably stupid when they were going at Garrett and they just didn't see that it was the wrong person. I don't know. I, I couldn't go that far with them, I guess. And it kind of took me out of it. I like the opening of the sketch because uh, Belushi's just kind of, you know, let her die type mentality. It was just the way he delivered it. it just like I couldn't stop laughing at it. Just like to the point and dark. Like, I want to leave the hospital. I don't want to pay this money. You know, whatever. I didn't know what I was going to expect from this sketch. And then once I had the thing that said Mercy Killers, like as soon as you got to that title card, I was all in on it. I thought it was really well done. The part that killed me the most was their theme song during the credits at the end that Bill was singing. Like, Chef's Kiss. I love that. Like, (laughs) if you were to tell, if this was the only two sketches, the only three sketches we watched tonight, this would probably easily be my favorite of the night. I don't know what that says about me as a person, but like, it's so good. All right. It was a good sketch, right? We now go to Weekend Update, and it's led in by a picture of Gerald Ford with Mickey Mouse, and it's another Betty Ford facelift joke. Ancient bones were found in Cairo, believing to be those of John the Baptist, but it was actually a dinosaur. Uh, Jane says John the Baptist was believed to be a swamp-dwelling herbivore who was over seven feet, 70 feet long. Reports that McDonald's is putting worms in their burgers. They deny this, but McDonald's can't explain why burgers crawl away uh, after you cut them. After calls of racism, Sambo's Restaurant says they're going to change their name to Bob's Jew Boy. 
Then there's a bit about the Vatican Bank helping Italians avoid t- paying tax. So the gossip columnist from the Vatican newspaper, uh, Father Guido Sarducci, comes in. Sarducci says it's all sour grapes from the government and the press. He says if the Vatican can get money coming in rather than going out, everyone will just leave them alone. The Vatican will now act as an exchanger for money. So you can send American dollars to the Vatican and they'll switch it into uh, whatever European currency you want. And you'll get prizes or presents, I suppose, gifts for giving money to the Vatican Bank. A thousand bucks will get you a pair of gloves. Two thousand dollars will get you a Zodiac wall clock. If you send a letter before January 1st for two dollars and fifty cents, you can get a guide to the confessional. It's a book to teach people how to how to weasel around and maneuver themselves in the confession booth. And he, he makes a reference to basically this book being the sin equivalent of a good accountant. Roseanne Rosanna Dana comes in and turns a bit about quitting smoking into seeing people naked in the change room of her gyms and using the sauna. And she was once sitting next to Dr. Joyce Brothers, who had a ball of sweat hanging off the tip of her nose that just wouldn't fall off. Jane asks what this whole thing has to do with cigarettes. Roseanne, of course, says if it's not one thing, it's another. Smoking or sweat falls, something is going to happen to you. Roseanne then sings a song she says is one she knew when she was a kid about uh, grace before dinner. But it actually turns out to be a reference to Dr. Joyce Brothers. thought this was a pretty strong update. It's been a while since we last saw Roseanne, which was good. She was starting to get on my nerves a little bit. I'm always down for Father Guido. It was short on strong jokes, but there were a couple in there I really enjoyed. Oh, and the McDonald's groundworms. I mean, I was told that when I was a kid, and I believed that till I was about 20. So they obviously didn't do that great of a job dispelling that rumor. What are you thinking, guys? I'm having a rough time this episode. Personally, I guess I'm okay. I, I didn't deal like, with Like, I'm picking out things like, oh, cool, an old styrofoam container that they're using uh, from McDonald's. The the fried lice joke was especially gross, so I kind of liked it because it was gross. I really was disappointed with the Sarducci bit this time. When, when I saw Roseanne come out, I thought, okay, give me some energy. This episode needs it. I need it in this episode. And there was a silliness about her that I liked tonight. The wig was really catching my eye tonight. And when she talked about somebody's belly button being like a little knob on like a door, uh, it was one of my favorite laughs of the evening. Of course, I always like Jane's visible disgust. So it, uh, it ended on a high note, but I thought it was a pretty terrible weekend update overall. Try to understand why Bill is there for this particular weekend, because there was a lot going on easily could have just passed his stuff off to, to jane uh like i'm not sure if they don't believe that she can pull it off by herself i'm not sure and i like bill murray i like him a lot i don't know i just didn't understand why he was there particularly maybe to work off father Saducci, but which i enjoyed him uh rosanna rosanna da, 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 da. however you go about that that word vomit of a name highlight of that whole of that whole bit just her energy her little rant I had me in stitches I'm choking on my own rage here no. just trying to say why bill was there i just just didn't seem like he needed to be there i just it bothered me i'm not sure why it bothered me but it bothered me yeah for some reason they decided jane can't do it alone and i think it was a mistake he looked visibly not cool with the with the fried lice joke which was a funny joke a little funny joke but he just looked uncomfortable telling it whereas i'm, I'm sure jane would have no problem t- telling the joke just going straight forward like it just he seemed a bit weak in comparison to everybody else that was there so it took a bit of that away from it yeah, I find him an upgrade from Ackroyd, but Jane could be doing this by herself, I think. We are now off to the second set from the Blues Brothers. They do I Got Everything I Need, Almost, and B-Movie Boxcar Blues. Again, very high energy, very spirited performance from both. That band is absolutely awesome. This is This was another really enjoyable segment for me. Not much to say beyond, like, the polish this act was lacking the last time is 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 there and uh i really enjoyed this uh yes it's kind of the same deal for me in that i am just not the market for it it is just not for me but i mean you know i i watch it i'm not out here skipping it can't knock the energy they bring but i i and you know i'm not just going to sit here and shit on it that's not reasonable uh i just don't like it in comparison to a lot of the other musical acts that i've seen doing the show with you guys very high energy very competent uh something i legitimately enjoy as well because that was an issue with a lot of the older musical acts is they might have someone i enjoy but it was mostly just music for music's sake i feel uh this worked really well and i think kind of meshed with the show as well for people that maybe are kind of 
phasing out a little bit. Uh, although the, I find the show had decent energy throughout, so I, I think this adds a bit more to that. Absolutely fantastic. They look like they're having a great time. The band's having a great time. The audience is having a great time. That's the most important part. Uh, we're now off to Mr. Bill. He's going sailing in a country lake. Mr. Hands gives him a hat and puts a fisherman's hook in it. The hook impales Mr. Bill's head. Uh, Mr. Hands then makes Spot and puts him on a hook and uses him as bait to go fishing. Uh, they fish up Mr. Sluggo, who harpoons Mr. Bill, and uh, he's then sort of uh, reeled away for Mr. Bill. I did find this one kind of funny. I found this one was especially painful. Poor little guy. But, uh, you know, not a Mr. Bill fan, but didn't mind this one too much. I needed this as a bit of a palate cleanser. You know, I, I do like Mr. Bill generally, and I, I just needed him to have a minute. Like, oh, good, Mr. Bill, he's outside the city. Maybe, oh, Mr. Hand, be, be, be careful, please. And it just, oh, my God, it just was so bad so quickly. Fuck Sluggo, too, by the way. Uh, this was an absolute tragedy. Not my favorite, Mr. Bill. Just too much torture too fast. I, I feel like he didn't even get that brief moment in the sun. Uh, it made my heart hurt. I always love Mr. Bill. I'm never going to have a bad thing to say about a Mr. Bill bit. Pretty pretty dark right from the get-go, though. Like, yeah, he didn't have a lot of time to just, you know, enjoy being on the water, going fishing. It was just straight into pain and misery. But otherwise, uh, yeah, it was pretty good. It was fun. Enjoyed it. Maybe I just enjoy pain. I don't know. <laughs> We now go to tomorrow, and again, we have Dan as Tom Snyder. Snyder talks about Thanksgiving and talking about how he went and bought an electric steak knife rather than sharpening his old ones. He's interviewing Carrie Fisher, who's playing Linda Blair. Though, though she's only 19, she's been around the block, been through the mill. Did a picture called The Exorcist using, using language that is, to say the least, a bit raw. Having played Satan, Snyder wonders how did she keep up with her schoolwork? Linda, Linda says she hasn't. She can't read English and knows only three states. It's mentioned that Tom can't laugh without scaring children. Uh, Tom says he scared the bejesus out of his stage manager's child. Linda mentions that he also scares adults, too. Tom goes through a whole thing about cocaine because Linda was recently caught with it, and uh, he wants to know what that was all about. She says it was bad cocaine. It had been cut with uh, powdered milk. He says that if it were him, he would have gone back to the dealer or the fence and <laughs> demanded a refund. He wonders what's next for Linda Blair. She thinks she has a lot to look forward to. She's only 19. She has some bad marriages, some household accidents, and maybe a few nervous breakdowns in her future. Blair then, in the devil's voice, offers Tom some blow. Excellent sketch. Can never get enough of Dan's Tom Snyder. Thought his wordplay. He went through a whole list of synonyms for coke here. It was really, really funny. Carrie Fisher, I think, was really good. I don't know Linda Blair to be this much of a, a bubblehead. I did feel a little bad for Linda Blair in this sketch. She's only 19, and they're really running her over the coals on live TV. I absolutely agree that it was great. But much like you, I'm like, fucking back off Linda Blair a little. Especially, don't you tell me that of all people, like some one of the original not ready for primetime players, and Carrie Epping Fisher going to sit there and crack jokes about somebody with getting caught for drugs get out of here no business doing it did not like that kind of disappointed but tom's great the fact that his laugh <laughs> terrifies children uh really made me laugh and <laughs> telling like they already said the yeah, guy just tell your cocaine dealer you'll take your business elsewhere he was really funny always does the character so well carries reagan voice was terrible at the end too and her linda blair was just 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 nothing she wasn't do, trying to do anything being a ditz I, so i didn't get that part so it was fine i found the two of them played off each other very well that was really uh fun to see the the joke about cutting it with powdered milk i found it super funny uh really well put together laughed a lot i'll be honest i'm still gonna say i laughed a lot at the the cocaine jokes but again i'm a horrible horrible person <laughs> <laughs> My biggest laugh of the episode was probably when he said uh, dealer pusher or fence. When he said <laughs> fence, I was done. <laughs> Again, like the, probably another the highlight sketch for me, to be honest, altogether, yeah. all, all things considered. We're now off to the World Bar, a.k.a. Marseille. It's a bar filled with uh, sailors and loose women, and it's set in Marseille, 1978. It starts with Belushi as Eddie and old sea dog telling a story to Jane and Gilda, their two French barflies. The girls get some drinks from him and then ask for money for the jukebox. They move off as he continues talking. Bill then enters as a dapper naval officer. 
Lorraine tries to get a drink from him, and uh, he asks her why. She says she's thirsty and she likes him, so Bill orders her a water, much to her disgust. Dan, as the bartender, says that the women there only drink champagne. Bill uh, gets uh, his beer and goes and sits at a table. Carrie then comes over as another one of the uh, the ladies of the bar. Bill says he knows her game. She will only get drinks from him until his money runs out. Dan tries to move her along, but she says she likes Bill and she's going to stick around and buy her own drinks. Bill says the last time he was in a bar, he spent 80 bucks and didn't even get drunk. She says he should save his money. She then starts talking about mutual funds and pulls out a mutual fund form from her boot. If Bill signs up, the contract gets sent to a, their Swiss bank where it will be invested for him, and the money will come right out of Bill's paycheck. Carrie then starts to pleasure Bill as he considers signing the contract, which he does as she seductively explains the way that mutual funds work. Garrett comes over asking about the funds. He says he noticed in the small print that Carrie's character is going to get to keep the money he invests for the first year. It turns out uh, Dan is actually a broker, and rather than sort of running these women as, as a pimp, he's more or less a mutual fund manager. He congratulates Carrie for selling, uh, breaking a new record, selling 18 glasses of champagne and two mutual funds. I thought this was extremely clever, very well performed, uh, a very good sketch. There was something missing that didn't put it over the top for me. But I mean, I recently had to go through this whole mutual fund stuff myself, um, and it wasn't quite like this. I wish my mutual fund meeting went like this. It would have been a lot more <laughs> interesting as they asked me a thousand questions about uh, everything from the past like four years. Yeah, I enjoyed. Did this you guys not get hand jobs when you went to talk about your mutual funds? No, no. I don't know if I would have liked the hand job. There was too many calluses on the guy's hands. But <laughs> I'll give you a card. I got a card. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was uh, it was a fun sketch. It's one of those um, smart joke type sketches. So I'm going to pretend that I got all those jokes and say it was super funny. Uh, but I didn't really catch it in the beginning, but when she pulled out the funds out of her boot and started talking about mutual funds, I was right back into the sketch. So, yeah, it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty clever, too. Yeah, funny. I, I was really, I couldn't believe uh, that, that uh, you know, I thought that hand job joke was pretty racy. Uh, but and Bill was so good in it. I uh, thought everybody did a great job and it didn't overstay its welcome, uh, which I was worried about. And which you easily could have done because they 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 were right at the line. They stopped short. So did she. And then Bill put her hand back down. Hey -oh. <laughs> we're now off to Bad Chinese Ballet by Tom Schiller. And we have the intro, of course, from Leonard Pince Garnell. He talks about this Chinese ballet being first done at the Lady Bird Memorial, Lady Bird Johnson Memorial Fund financed by a Texas millionaire who later married the author of the ballet, who is also a keychain manufacturer on the side. And this ballet was all about preparing women in Red China for an invasion by U.S. forces. So a bunch of women come out with signs and guns and the version of the sort of Red China citizen's uniform. Dan had previously mentioned a subtle reference to an American invasion. Turns out to be Garrett playing uh, Mickey Rivers sliding in to third base wearing his New York Yankee uniform. He is then beaten severely by the women. Dan then announces the cast members. The women are played by members of the Austin Chamber of Commerce. Garrett, of course, playing Mickey Rivers. And the flag bearer was a returning Ronnie Bateman, played by Bill. These are usually lots of fun. I, I think this was fun in, in a lot of ways. It's definitely not the best of the bad series. I got a kick at a Garrett and how he was, you know, the not-so-subtle reference to U.S. imperialism. This was very short, so it, it, it didn't bother me as much as it could have had it gone on as long as like the Lewin Hook one had done. Great series, ho-hum sketch. Yeah, I think you're right. Usually like these a little more. I never like them as much as you do. Uh, and other than I, I did laugh at the Mao flag uh, for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe I just think Mao's funny. Not that what he did's funny. That's not what I mean. Mao comedy? If, is there such a thing? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, cheerfully withdrawn. Uh, you're right. It didn't overstay its welcome. It was in, it was out. And uh, I did appreciate that. It was just a little silly slice of late show fun. Yep. It was short. Loved it. That's it. That's, that's, that's my note on it. Done. Yep. We're good. <laughs> like, it was fun. It was short. It didn't, it didn't overstay its welcome, good or bad. It was short enough that uh, I, I enjoyed it. Got my chuckle. Move on to the next bit. And the next bit is also from Tom Schiller. It's one of Schiller's reels. And this is the fourth or fifth one we've seen. I think it's the fourth one we've seen an older woman narrates a whole movie of her trip to rome with her husband called roman 
Roman had been recovering from a coronary bypass. And there's a lot of clips of the couple traveling around. She talks about all the places they went, having a great time. He's obviously getting tired from the trip, though, as we see him like carrying his carrying her bags around and uh, his, his feet are sore at one point. We see all of a sudden a young Italian man named Tony who has befriended the couple, especially her. Then Roman dies at the dinner table. She and Tony continue on the trip and they get married because her, her husband's uh, medical insurance covered the honeymoon. This was really short. Great piece. thought this was really, really funny. I really enjoyed this. The, the poor old guy just keeling over. And I always wonder about that when somebody gets sick and they say, well, take a vacation. It's, it'd be nice and relaxing. Most vacations are not relaxing at all. I don't know why you take a relaxing vacation in Rome. I've been to Rome. It's a lot of walking. It's a lot of steps. It's a lot of heat. It's very warm. Um, so I could see why he died during his trip. 100%. I can relate to that. I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed this. So like Again, probably one of the highlights of the, the show for me. I just... Uh, it's it's very normal kind of thing, and then he dies. It gets a bit absurdist, and then it has a nice little happy ending to it. And it's it's funny all all around. It's it's really good. I really enjoyed it. Happy and happy ending for her. <laughs> well, if you think about it, isn't death the ultimate happy ending? Maybe so. I'm, I'm gonna die after this episode. This episode has taken joy from me. Uh, I have really found it a slog. I did not think this was funny. I, I didn't find the old couple funny, him dying funny, the grain footage. Oh, my God. I, I, I was I was near death. <laughs> yeah, we're on different pages tonight, buddy. Very different pages tonight. This has been a challenge for me. So we're now at the good nights. Carrie says good nights. The Blues Brothers are front and center. I noticed that even as even as Elwood Blues, Dan bails pretty quickly. So let's rate this show. Uh, the host, I thought Carrie Fisher was excellent. Up to this point, like her TV and film per, uh, performing career was somewhat limited. She had a hurdle to overcome without being seen as Princess Leia the whole night. And I thought she did a great job. She was a mix at times. She was the funny one in the sketch. She was the straight one in the sketch. And even in that uh, that uh, Mercy Killer, she was just a supporting player. Uh, I thought as a host, she was excellent. I really was pleased. I feel like they should have used her a bit more, to be honest. I think if she would have been in Mercy Killers, um, you know, I think they should have leaned into her not straight man type uh, chops. That she's actually, you know, she's she's quite funny. But at the same time, she did a good job. She did the best of what she had there. And I was pretty happy with her as the host. Again, could have done without the, the Princess Leia bit. But at the same time, you know, that's what she's known for at the time. That's the audience they're trying to bring into the show. So it's understandable. But uh, yeah. Outside of that, pretty good. I think I agree with Kevin. I found there was kind of an underutilization of her when she seemed comfortable and fine with everything she was in. Uh, it's impossible to say what's going on in writers' rooms, of course, but uh, I didn't find that she was around or as prominent as she should have been. But when she was there, she was fine. The music. It's a little different when we're looking at the Blues Brothers. These guys are cast members, and the show is sort of doing what it can to promote what they're up to. Um, much to maybe their future detriment. That being said, I really think Dan and John are good at what they did here. And what they're lacking in traditional musicianship, if they are lacking, um, is made up for with their energy, their showmanship, and an excellent backing band. They do a fantastic job getting the audience up and excited. And I just thought this was a, a really strong performance, uh, actually better than their Steve Martin performances last year it's just not for me i, I liked the energy uh and i don't you know music is so subjective so I, there's there's no uh it would be foolish for me to describe in any detail why it's not for me uh, especially on this platform suffice it to say it is not uh but i i, I liked the uh the electricity at the very least i thought they did excellent Although a lot of that has to do with the actual band that's working with them at the same time. I think the band should have got a bit more recognition for the musical numbers than just the Blues Brothers. Not saying that they didn't do a bad job. They, sent, they did a great job. But the only reason they did such a good job was just how on task the band was with like filling in the energy for them to work off of. But otherwise, yeah, I really enjoyed the music. So uh, what was the worst sketch of the night? Oh, my worst sketch of the night. You said worst sketch of the night, yeah? Yeah. Oh, 50s beach space trip, whatever the hell that was. It went on <laughs> forever. I thought they were hacky Star Wars jokes. <laughs> I don't cranky in a net jokes. 
Come on. It's 1978. <laughs> I, I know you want to make some Star Wars jokes, but go into the 50s beach party. Get it together. Put Princess Leia in a punk club. Send her to see the Sex Pistols. Do something cool. Not cool. Not cool. I'm going to agree with Matt. Um, I didn't hate the sketch. It's a really long sketch. Um, but in comparison to all the other stuff that was done tonight, it, it's obviously the weakest of the bunch, in my opinion. But yeah, it, I would say it's the uh, Beach Blanket Bimbo from Outer Space. I believe that's the title of the sketch. <laughs> yes, uh, is, yeah. Just a lot going on. It's it's a little cringy at parts. Um, there are jokes there, but they kind of get lost in all the other minutia of the whole sketch. It's just it's It's not great. Well, it's obvious tonight that I really enjoyed tonight's show, and I had a real, real, really hard time picking my least favorite, and my favorite, too, because I'm getting away from putting the Mr. Bills in the short films in here, and I'm trying to keep it just to the sketches. Problem is, for me, every sketch tonight was pretty strong, so I actually went with the Chinese ballet as my least favorite tonight, which might be a shocker because uh, I know we all enjoyed it, but I liked everything else a little bit more, I think. What was your best sketch of the night, guys? I thought the Loud family was pretty clever. Uh, I thought it was a silly joke that they really kept afloat for a long time. Everybody was really funny in it. Gilda was killing it. And <laughs> yeah, did Dan speaking normally. When somebody just speaking normally uh, gets a good laugh out of me, you've done it right. It's hard for me because outside of the, the beach blanket, bimbo, outer space, bleh, sketch, I thought all the other sketches were pretty strong. I'm going with Mercy Killers simply because I really enjoyed that sketch like a lot, a lot more than I care to mention. Um, it would have been nice if uh, Carrie had a bit of a bigger part in there. But again, it's just the title card and then the little theme song at the end of it and all the other little stupid jokes. It's just it's such a ridiculous premise. And I absolutely mm. love this. I, I was torn, but I went with Beach Blanket Bimbo from Outer Space. Um, completely different reasons is why you hated it. I think actually the reason you guys hated it Part of the reason I liked this tech that there were some tech glitches, but beyond that, I mean, this was a perfect parody of these old stupid movies. And yeah, they're getting their shots in at Frankie and Annette, but this is this is this whole thing was hilarious to me. Catchy, I found it catchy. Matt, you found it annoying. Song in there, uh, two of them actually, and just uh, I mean, I laugh at like Vincent Price and Chubby Checker just randomly showing up. Um, Alan Zweibel surfs up, crack me up. I just, I, I know these movies so well and, and hate them so much that this, this worked for me. You know, maybe shame on me for picking the, the, the overly goofy one, but I, I adored it. I thought it was great. Who was your star of the night, fellas? I give my star of the night to Dan Aykroyd, even though I don't love his Vincent Price impression. Uh, his performance in Tomorrow was great. I thought he was good in the, uh, the uh, Paris mutual funds brothel house whatever the hell it was toward at the end and uh he really brought it as his dancing as uh is my favorite part of the blues brothers when he's kicking out those long legs and going crazy uh i i noticed him every time he was on tonight so dan for me yeah it's gonna be dan for me as well he wore a lot of different hats in this episode um really played to a lot of his strengths through the entire through the, through the entire episode like they're, they're like even uh the lowest part of a sketch he was not a part of the lowest part. He was the, the part that made it a little bit more enjoyable. Even the uh, beach, da 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 da. Um, it, as uh, weird and pervy as his Vincent Price was to me, I still got a chuckle from him. So, yeah, I would say Dan Aykroyd is uh, my my, uh, my top of the night. Yeah, I, I also went with Dan. We have a sweep here for Dan Aykroyd. I don't think I think I think based on what they did, the choices tonight had to be Dan or John. Um, but then when we look at all the stuff, Dan was in almost every segment. He even voiced Obi-Wan Kenobi. You know, he didn't do updates. But beyond that, he was everywhere. Obi-Wan, Vincent Price, soft-spoken Rick and the Lo Loud family, Tom Snyder, the uh, the mutual fund pimp and in the uh, the world bar. Uh, yeah, this was this was Dan Aykroyd's night. No question about it. So overall, there was a joke last week on the show and Matt alluded to it that the Buck Henry episode, they just coasted because they already started working on this episode. And I kind of believe that. I thought this was well-written, well-performed, high energy. Everyone had something to do. Lorraine might have gotten the shaft a little bit on this one. But for everyone else, this was excellent ensemble comedy. They had to address Star Wars, so they did it at the top and they got it out of the way and then they moved on. 
everyone I thought was uh, great throughout. Fisher was right on. The music was great. Audience was in on it. Um, and they really didn't rely too hard on the recurring characters. I think we only got to see Roseanne, Rosanna Dana, and Leonard Pint Garnell. You know, Bimbo, like it or not, was probably one of their most ambitious sketches to date. And Loud Family, which was hilarious, was laughably simple, and they had everything in between. Um, and the worst sketch for me, being the Chinese ballet, was still a really strong sketch. And we had a good chiller reel in there. I, I really enjoyed this episode. I actually gave this an 8.5 out of 10. For me, I would say this is a solid 7. Just 7. For me, it didn't have too many lows. I had a, a decent amount of highs. Um, but again, the the beach blanket bimbo for outer space. It's just, it's a long, it's a long sketch. It's a long title. It just, it bothers me. Uh, but outside of that, the rest of the show is fantastic. Uh, I just feel like they could have used, if they utilized Carrie a little bit uh differently i think i would have given it a higher rating um but everything else from the music to a lot of the performances was was fantastic setting aside the music because it's just not my thing but i mean i didn't enjoy it that's my rating uh i found this show a real train wreck with really poor attention to detail and uh, some really good concepts like the mercy killers that that really just didn't play out uh, the way it was supposed to an underutilization of the host uh, an underutilization of Lorraine, and I barely saw Jane. Uh, and sometimes I'm like, what the hell am I watching here? Yeah, I, I was pretty disappointed throughout. I didn't think it was particularly sharp. Weekend Update I thought was a dud. Uh, and I thought this was a slog to sit through. I give this a four. It's quite a range between Matt and I. Kevin, you're kind of right in the middle there. So with my 8.5, Matt's four, Kevin seven, we wind up with a 6.5. Over at the IMDb, they went with a straight eight, which is exactly our exchange rate of 1.5 and the difference. It's funny how that keeps popping up, Matt. That's a day one thing that we noticed. Yeah, it's good to keep track of, I think. At least yeah, I think. Yeah. It as far as the IMDb is concerned, this is the best episode of the year. We've ranked number one out of 20 uh, already. Um, our cumulative scores and our individual scores uh, disagree with that. And all things considered, we, we still gave it a half decent score. So, yeah, not a bad, uh, a good one for me, not a bad one from Kevin, and a, a train wreck from Matt. That's the Carrie Fisher episode. We don't get to see Carrie again on the show, unfortunately. They could have used her, I'm sure, later. So, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Carrie Fisher episode. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and we're going to have you back again this season. Always glad to be here, and I'm actually glad that I got to enjoy the music this time. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> have me back anytime. Matt, do you know who our next host is going to be? Uh, Walter Matthau, did I hear? It is Walter Matthau. Do you know the musical guest? No, please tell. Hold on to your hats for this one. Garrett Morris. Whoa, that's cool. I'm down. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. Walter Matthau, a big fan of classical and opera, wanted a uh, wanted Garrett as his musical guest. So it gets me a, gets a point already, even though Jane has said that Walter Matthau was her least favorite host. Ooh, I'm curious wow. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll be back in about a week, but until then, we'll be selling mutual funds in the seediest bars of France here in it.